Please join me in welcoming, welcoming Dr. Sheila Patak to the stage. Good morning. I am really glad to be here. My trusty Prius did not start. And I had a taxi driver who really showed up in 10 minutes because there were no Ubers. And then he drove me at 80 miles an hour here. And I was thinking about the acceleration of race cars and how inadequate they are, not to mention the, um, the, the taxi this morning. Anyway, we're going to talk about that. No joke. So I'm going to talk about power today, and it's really exciting to talk to this particular audience because I think I'm a bit of a maverick in the sense of my the particular systems that I work on, but what I want to talk to you and, and um, communicate with you, hopefully both in the context of this talk and throughout the meeting, is how the fundamentals of what most of you and many of you work on um, are really in the systems that I work on, and we share a lot of different approaches. Um, so let me get this. So when I was looking through all of the talks that are coming up in the next few days, a lot of discussion, a lot of research in the world of biomechanics, especially on the vertebrate side, addresses energy flow. And one of my favorite examples, not to mention just because he's a friend, uh, is Greg Sawicki's recent work on, um, on the exoskeleton, and I think this, if anyone has a better name, I'm going to one. Um, the, the adding an exoskeleton to the incredibly efficient locomotor system in humans deals with energy flow. Where is the energy? How do we enhance the efficiency of these motions? Um, there are also the classic spring mass models that differentiate between different types of locomotor modes. And then we can even think about elastic strain energy storage in bones and skulls and how is energy distributed there. We can talk about the efficiency of motion, like the cicadas. Hopefully you've heard our wonderful ones here in North Carolina. An example of elastic motion that is extremely efficient, and that extends on to um, swimming as well as flying. One of my favorite ways that um, energy flow and elastic movement has been expressed for the vertebrates was in a paper written by Tom Roberts and, and Manny Azizi back in 2011. And what they did is they um, sort of split out the general categories in which elastic um, structures play a role. And on the far left-hand side, I actually really do need a laser pointer if anyone has. Like, they're getting one. Awesome. Thank you so much. I can't. I, maybe you guys can see this, but I don't, I don't see it on the screen. It was working a few minutes ago. Um, so on the left-hand side, we can talk, think about energy conservation. In this case, that the red color on the screen is energy, and it's moving from the body to the spring and back to the body. And we, we think about that in terms of metabolic economy, running, hopping, walking, cyclical, highly efficient motion. On the very right-hand side, we can think about it also in terms of power attenuation. So here the energy is moving, moving from the body to the spring and to the muscle, and this is to dissipate energy through, in situations where there's landing or high forces. And then the center column is power amplification, and this is fundamentally where uh, my research program operates. And in power amplification, you're essentially starting with the motor, so see where the red color is in the muscle, and that motor is generating work. It moves elastic energy storage into the spring, and then the spring releases that energy back to the body over a much shorter time period, and then you get power amplification. So we see that in jumping, uh, acceleration, incline running, and ballistic feeding. This is very well understood in, in the vertebrates, and um, this is obviously a major focus for this uh, audience. And what I'm going to do today is um, talk about uh, a, a really um, a, a subset or maybe even a separate category in, in and of itself of power amplification and motion, which I'll call impulsive movement today. I, I, I've been working with a team of scientists and engineers on what to call this realm. Um, a few weeks ago it was ultra fast. Today it's impulsive. So let me, I'd love to have a discussion about what's the right word for this. Um, and when I, when I say impulsive movement, I mean truly extreme asymmetry of energy flow. And there's power amplification, as we've already talked about, systems that decrease the time to perform work. But there's also the incorporation of latches and triggers. And these latches allow for greater potential energy storage in the system, and it, they reduce the transition time from potential to kinetic energy. In the vertebrate worlds, the search for latches and triggers and, um, is ongoing. Um, there are subtle ones present in some systems, as you know. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Um, and let's see how this goes. Okay, it's still in the 
this one. I think it might just be page. You know, we'll just, I'll, I'll just use my voice. All right. Sometimes the, the, I'm just not going to worry about it. I would fly over there a few times and keep my flight with me. Um, so the, the, the search for lives and triggers are, are, are often in place in a very ge geometrical sense in the vertebrates. But when you move outside the vertebrates, latches and triggers are pretty extraordinary. We're going to see a few of those today. And finally, the final sort of real distinguishing feature of these systems is that the energy is primarily directed to the environment. Rather than motion, rather than energy cycling through the system for extremely efficient cyclical motion, it's going out to the environment. I'm going to show you a couple examples of what I'm talking about. So one system that we've worked on and we are working on in my lab is trap giants. So these animals are, they're about a centimeter long. They have big force modified muscles that contract and store elastic energy and a latch releases and the jaws slam closed. These jaws move um, at 10 times the acceleration of a bullet. About 300 of them will fit within an eye blink if that were even possible, but it gives you sense of the duration. So 10 to the 6 meters per second squared. So they, they slam their jaws close to capture prey, but they also jump. And this is a, a video slowed down of an ant jumping with its jaws. If this were real time, it would be there, and it would be, then be gone, and on your leg stinging you. But this slows it down. And this is one of the crazier animal motions I've ever seen. Um, all this spinning doesn't give it lift, nothing, it just, that's just what happens. Um, and it doesn't hurt when they land because they're tiny. They can go up to 40 times their body length. And this has evolved um, multiple times in ants, and they just land or they, in their own habitat, they, they grab onto something. Um, and it's an extremely powerful motion for feeding and for locomotion. Another example is snapping shrimp. So snapping shrimp um, store uh, up energy through a slow, uh, muscle contraction that's trying to close their claw. There's a two adhesive patches that serve as the latch. When they break apart, the, the, the claw slams closed, and it generates such a fast jet of water that the water vaporizes behind it in a cavitation bubble. And when these bubbles collapse, it sets off a huge implosion that knocks out their prey, and they also fight with it. A third example that we work on in my lab are fungal ballista spores. And this is, of course, very different in the sense that there's no engine or muscle in the sense that we normally think of it, but it's still there. What these organisms do, and this is across uh, the fungi, the mushrooms you eat, they all have, many, almost all of them have this mechanism, where they grow a droplet on a stem, up over there on the right-hand side, um, you see the droplet indicated, and a surface, a very thin layer of water on a spore. And when the spore um, surface of water touches that droplet that it's growing, they fuse and it launches the spore off the stem. And it's an it's a incredibly fast motion. So the average acceleration of a missile, 300,000 of these would hit within, a, uh, hit within an eye blink. And they only go a meter per second because it's low Reynolds number. All of this is just to get the spore off the stem and off into the airflow. But their engine is essentially surface tension energy from a droplet. Um, incredibly powerful motion. What I'm going to do today is tell you five little stories about the impulsive realm. And I'm going to start by talking about what is fast. And then I, in the next four, I'm going to sort of go back and forth between the really good things that happen when impulsive systems evolve, and then the kind of bad things that happen. Um, like, it takes a long time to be extremely powerful. You know, as I was writing these, I was trying to write one, one sort of paragraph of statements about this realm, and I kept thinking, first of all, of Steve Vogel, who hopefully many of you knew, one of the greats of biomechanics who passed away, a very good friend of mine uh, last year. Um, and, and how you start with a word like impulsive, and from those wise Romans, and how it operates actually quite well, both in the human realm and in the uh, mechanical realm, so it turns out to be kind of weird. So it takes a long time to be extremely powerful. It's still taking me a long time to be extremely powerful. Um, impulsive animals are small, but achieve large animal performance, so that's a plus. Negative, extreme impulsive performance slows down evolutionary change. And then, I think a positive, losing control demands alternative behavior. So I'll tell you a little story about each one of those. And I'm going to focus on the major system in my lab, which is mantis shrimp. 
Now, mantis shrimp have um, superpower appendages that they use for capturing prey. And the, um, there are a number of different varieties, but the two major kinds are spears and smashers. So on the left-hand side, I'm going to show you a video of a spearing mantis shrimp. I took this, these videos off the coast of um, the Great Barrier Reef in Australia. They're actually here in Florida as well. Um, and what you can see is this animal's hiding in the sand and um, catching things as it goes, as they go by. Now, with the same exact machinery, on the right-hand side, I'm going to show you a smashing mantis shrimp working with a snail shell. So it's wiggling in its place, uh, touching with its tentacles, feeling it back and forth. And instead of using a spear, it just used a hammer. And it just used a hammer to break open a snail shell, and it takes me a hammer to break open. But their hammer is somewhere along the lines of a few toothpicks in terms of the mass. So they have a tremendous ability to break open her shell prey. We can slow down these movements. On the left side is a tiny little spear catching the brine shrimp. This is high speed video slowed down. And on the right hand side is a smashing mantis shrimp breaking a claw off of a crab. So, same machinery, but um, different ways that they're using it. So when we think about what is fast, when I went into this research, I expected, and I think this is true of the field in general, that the fastest movements on the planet are animals chasing other animals. So, to capture an invasive prey. This is like, this, is, this should take enormous amounts of speed. And I was completely wrong. And the, the mantis shrimp were, I think, the first window, really concrete window into this that would open up a general realization, this in general, for people who study kinematics of motion. So what we found is that if you look at the best spear and compare it to the best smasher, a spear that can catch a fish swimming by is going five times more slowly in terms of speed, two orders of magnitude more slowly in terms of acceleration, and pretty long durations. But the best spear going at six meters per second is considered fast by any standard in animal motion. It's, that's the same speed as squid tentacles, it's the same speed as a swimming fish. That's, that's impressively fast. But it turns out you really don't need to be that fast to capture a basin, right? On the right hand side is the smasher. So the smasher, that hammer is moving at the same acceleration as a bullet in a gun. Incredibly fast. And that snail is not running anywhere, believe me. Just happily sitting there. Well, maybe not happily, <laughs> but sitting there, right? So clearly, what is fast does not necessarily have to be about chasing prey. It could be about a totally different ecology. We're going to see this many times today with these impulsive systems. So what is fast? This is a little bit hard to read, but I'm going to show you a much easier one in the next slide. But if you look at the purple, right, these are things that we typically think of as reasonably fast. An eye blink is at the bottom of duration here in terms of impulsive systems. Cheetah is pretty good, 25 meters per second, but cheetah doesn't even show up on duration. It's a long acceleration. Human runner, not bad, 12 meters per second. I'm certainly not doing that. Um, on the far right acceleration, um, cheetah and human runner are dead bottoms. These are not impulsive systems. Um, at, at, at a race car, I really was thinking about this this morning with my uh, Chapel Hill taxi. Um, you know, down there at 10, um, uh, 10, uh, 10 squared, 100 meters per second squared, um, spearing mantis shrimp and chameleon tongues are there with missiles, and fungal spores and smashing mantis shrimp are up there with bullets, um, and then actually trap jaw ends and nematocysts, the stinging cells of jellyfish, are two orders of magnitude better than a bullet. So we're talking incredible amounts of variation in acceleration and duration, but not speed. You know, it's funny, I, when, as I go back in and out of these systems and I look at the, at the, the writing and biomechanics in general, I mean, people have been talking about the fact that speed just doesn't vary very much across organismal systems. And um, here again, we see that there's only two orders of magnitude of difference in speed here, but six to seven orders of magnitude in terms of acceleration and duration. So when we think about what is fast, I think it's time to put away the speed, because I'm thinking that that's just probably you know, something that can be fussed around with. But when we look at acceleration and duration, is where we start to see some crazy functions show up. So up at the top is nanoscale puncture. That's the stinging needle of a jellyfish that's, that's puncturing at the nanoscale. We see low Reynolds number launching, impacts, suction traps, pollen launching, and as we slowly get towards the bottom, we start to see the low end of impulsive systems, which is jumping, which 
conceptually that one big dump and there's a nice toxin on it that's coming kind of back. So what is facts? Probably not necessarily what we've often thought about it. Um, and one of my favorite examples of this, when I first talked about this uh, this jump between what is fast and um, and you know rethinking what that means, there was a paper about how fast cheetahs uh, run. It came out after I gave that talk, and, and actually the, the, a good bit of the cheetah running uh, dynamics was about why it's not that fast. Um, so. We, you know, we're shifting as we get better and better capabilities of seeing these extraordinary motions, our notion of what is fast and what is poor. Okay, it takes a long time to be extremely powerful. So this is where we start to see that maybe it's not all great being super impulsive. I think this audience, of any audience of any conference in the month of um, August will know this, but just as a reminder, all motors suffer from a force velocity trade-off. This is beautifully illustrated in muscle. Force times velocity is power. You can either get a lot of force and a little velocity, or a lot of velocity and a little force. But you can't have both. You just can't have both. And that means that powerful impulsive motion cannot and is not driven by muscle directly. Never. It's impossible. So what we see is that muscle contraction and spring loading occur before the movement. The latches and triggers release the potential energy, and then springs actuate the not muscle. So we're talking about um, spring-driven impulsive systems here. We've also seen, obviously, examples where it's surface tension energy um, and, and other systems that, that are relevant. But I'm talking about muscles here. So you know this, but this is, even for my fellow biomechanists, this is a strange thing to keep in mind. So muscle is generating the work, but it is not what is making the movements. It's springs that are making these movements. And Springs, it turns out, we know very little about in terms of a comparative functional framework at these time scales. So if we look at the mantis shrimp, a mantis shrimp can generate 10 to the fifth watts per kilogram muscle. This is impossible. So that means that a muscle is not generating this power output. Because we know that high power muscle this is a little bit out of date, but you know, on the order of 400 watts per kilogram. So in order to do this, that means something else is generating this motion. So in a mantis shrimp, they have a nice big contraction and, um, of an of a, of a opening muscle, but nothing moves because, um, oops, there we go, because the latch is uh, holding it in place. And then when the latch opens, the, the, bus, the, the pedish can move. But this is still not enough because the muscle is not opening this. In spite of what that drawing shows you, the muscle is not generating this motion. Instead, it's a linkage system and an elastic structure. So the muscle is actually storing elastic energy in a spring, and that energy is delivered to the appendage through a linkage system, not the muscle. Interestingly, across mantis shrimp, we're going to come back to this quite a bit, that muscle forebar linkage spring latch tool theme is present across all of them. And this starts to give us some really great material for asking questions about, like, well, what happens with springs? What, what aspects of springs should vary if a motion is driven entirely by a spring? So we've done a fair bit of comparative work. And I'll show you uh, two, two findings on, on this topic of what it means to be powerful and what are the costs that come along with it. So this graph shows the size of an appendage on the x-axis and the work that goes into a spring on the y-axis. So we tested springs on my materials testing machine. And what we found is that for a given body size, smashers generate more work in their spring than spears. This makes sense, given the orders of magnitude greater acceleration. Clearly, the springs have to be more potent in smashing the shrimp than spearing the shrimp. But to not to, to throw down the gauntlet or anything, but we don't actually know, and I, I mean, I would love to be correct about this, because we've been looking for the past years of literature in both engineering and biological systems. We do not understand the real-time spring dynamics of these systems. And we I also do not know what the latch dynamics are. So here we have a motion driven by a spring, and that spring has never been tested at the right time scale. And that's generally true, except for like a couple of papers on rubber bands. So um, this is something that we're working on in the lab. I think very interesting and relevant to the vertebrate systems as well to really test the spring dynamics at the appropriate time scale. What happens with the muscle, though? 
So this graph shows the size of the appendage on the x-axis, and on the y-axis, circle your length. A wonderful thing about invertebrates is that they do not suffer from sarcomere length um, constraints the way vertebrates do. So you know, right, the sarcomeres and vertebrates are stuck around 2.2 microns, maybe a little bit of here and there. And actually, a lot of the variability in vertebrate muscle comes from other aspects of muscle physiology. In the invertebrates and arthropods, they have tremendous flexibility in the sarcomere realm and play a lot less with the physiology surrounding it. So if you look at the sarcomere lengths on the y-axis, those are all long, which means that they're force modified. The longer the sarcomere, the slower the contraction, the higher the force. Another, another manifestation of the force velocity trade-off. So in this graph, what this shows is that the most forceful muscle in a smasher can generate up to twice the force, but half the speed. This is a very serious practical matter for impulsive systems. Because if you're going to use a very high force muscle, it's going to take a long time to contract, which means it takes a long time to be extremely powerful, which then plays back into why we don't see extremely um, fast motion, or maybe not even needed, for capturing evasive prey. Spears have retained force-modified muscle, but they can respond to prey far more quickly than smashers can. So it, there's this trade-off that we understand intuitively with the archer example, where if you, just threw, if, you, if you saw a deer going by and you grabbed an arrow and you hucked the arrow at the deer, yeah, you would have responded quickly, but your arrow wouldn't take down the deer, would it? But if you want to have a really nice high-power output, you would have to pick up the bow, load the bow, and um, use the latch of your fingers and have that arrow go out with a great amount of power, but it took you a long time to do that. So it takes a long time to be extremely powerful, and this has pretty serious ecological implications for all of these systems. Okay, impulsive animals are small, but they achieve large animal performance. This is a thumbs up for impulsive, so let's look at this advantage room. This is a video of a small mantis shrimp that's going to break open a snail shell. A snail shell that would take me a hammer to break open. This animal's hammers have the same mass as two toothpicks. And you're going to watch it break open a snail shell um, without any trouble. By the way, Suzanne Cox is here. She's talking about uh, toads later. She took this awesome video. Incredible power from these bullet-like accelerations. When they do this, they cavitate. So not only are they generating extremely high impact, they're causing the water to vaporize. Cavitation is an extremely potent fluid dynamic phenomenon. But then you get when you have an area of high flow next to an area of low flow, you get low pressure, like the Bernoulli effect. The water vaporizes. When the vapor bubble collapses, it emits heat equivalent to the surface of the sun. It emits sound, it emits light. Anybody who's ever had to deal with bow propeller design knows this because bow propellers, steel bow propellers, wear away because of cavitation once you're spinning them so fast. The design of um, submarines are plagued by this because you can't move fast and quiet in the ocean because you cavitate. It's unavoidable. These animals are cavitating at the point of impact and they can strike tens of thousands of times between walls without. Um, completely self-destructing, although you can see in that bottom left-hand corner that they do experience wear on the camera. We're going to come back to this at um, the very end to just say that these animals only cavitate when they hit whatever they hit. They, when, no matter what they hit, they cavitate. But they do not cavitate during the rotation toward hitting when they should. So we're going to back to that a little bit. Okay. There are lots of force papers being presented here today. <laughs> and when I started this work, quite a few years ago now, when I wanted to measure the force of an organism. Um, it was strain gauges or you know, force plates, and my animals break these things, not to mention the fact that they need to be used in uh, salt water. So this is quite a few years ago now. Uh, but I was able to come up with a rig using a piezoelectric <laughs> impact sensor and waterproofed it, put it down in the tank with the animal, to ask the question, how much force are these animals generating, and does cavitation do anything? And they're cooperative, so I put a big pink blob on there, along with some fish stink, um, and they come up, and they hit it. And we collect data, 
So for all of you who have animals driving over treadmills, like this is my version of that. Um, they're very amenable to this. So even on a force sensor, we've tested this on all kinds of things. I'm being very, very superficial in this talk today, so give me the general point, but I'm happy to talk about force sensors uh, anytime. Um, the cavitation bubble still forms in between the two, and we can actually, at 100,000 frames per second, we can actually visualize um, what happens when the hammer hits the force sensor. Um, so it comes in and it impacts, and then you see the formation of cavitation, the collapse of the cavitation bubble, and it backs off of it, so there's uh, not a bounce at the time scales that we're dealing with. And we actually link up the force sensor to the video, so you can actually see what a single appendage strike looks like. So one high peak impact collapse of the cavitation bubble. Since I work in the world of extreme things, I try to put up averages. So an average strike, the cavitation impact is half the, the hammer impact, but many, many, many times it's up to three times the impact force. And that impact force is um, very, very impressive. So a peak impact force for um, a 20 to 60 gram animal is 1,500 newtons. So this is 2,500 times their body weight. Very, very high peak. Um, I've put up on the graph a typical strike, actually actually a lame strike for a reason I'm going to show you in a minute, um, of two hammers hitting. So one hammer comes in, impact habitation, second hammer, impact habitation. We can place this next to a more traditional system that also eats snails, so a horn shark, and people have put uh, four sensors in the mouth of a horn shark. Notice the same um, magnitude of peak force. But the shrimp strike is happening at a totally different time scale. And of course, because many of you work with this stuff, you also can see immediately that the energy under the curve for the horn shark is huge. The impulse is really huge. The energy under the curve for the mantis shrimp is tiny. The impulse is tiny. The peaks are similar. And so a 40 gram mantis shrimp is able to open up and generate the same peaks as a 3 kilogram horn shark. This is super interesting on many levels, not the least of which is nobody that I've ever been able to find, and I have searched far and wide across the world, can tell me how it is that four rapidly produced high peak impacts can break open a ceramic. And a lot of people are interested in this because before we did this work, ceramics, i.e. Uh, snail shells, were thought to be the superlative material in biology. And now we have uh, mantis shrimp hammers breaking the superlative material in biology. So there's been a lot of really interesting work on the engineering side of looking at the materials in the hammer, which I'm happy to talk about afterward if you're interested in that. So, but we still don't know how this breaks a snail shell. Why does that work? But maybe on the, the sort of a, the ending slide of this little section, um, I think this really captures the essence of what impulsive does for these animals. So this is a fabulous comparison um, based on mass and peak force. Of course, you all know the work on force. This is a strange way of thinking about it, just looking at peak rather than energy. But I think this is the, the, the relevant comparison here. But basically, a mantis shrimp is able to do um, at the order of 10 grams what a typical vertebrate across mammals, reptiles, birds, sharks, and fish, um, sharks are really fish, um, that uh, 10 to the fifth gram animal can do in that far right hand point up at the top is an alligator. So, impulsive animals are small, but they achieve large animal performance. Super interesting ecologically. Okay. Extreme impulsive performance slows down energy, uh, evolutionary change. Now, one of the things that we do in my lab that I am absolutely obsessed about is to understand the connection between physics and evolution. And I realize with this particular group, many of you are working on humans, and it's a tough thing to work on humans at comparisons at an evolutionary time scale with humans. You will do it, but it's hard. One of the reasons why I moved into these types of systems, like impulsive systems and the invertebrates, is it allows us to look at these dynamics, like what's happening with the evolution of the spring under different um, selection and different ecologies and different needs performance-wise. Furthermore, impulsive systems give us a way to study the evolutionary dynamics of mechanical components because they tend to be spatially and temporally separated. Many of you know, certainly in Greg Zwicky's lab, that tracking energy exchange through, between a muscle and a spring in a cyclic, highly efficient system is insanely difficult because they're so tightly coupled. They're practically one system working together. 
In impulsive systems, we have that separation out of an engine, like the muscle, an amplifier, the leakage system, leakage, spring and latch, adventure, and a tool, like a weapon for the camera. Because they are spatially and temporally separated, we can start to ask, what happens um, between these different structures, and, and how does that impact evolutionary diversification? Mantis shrimp have a wonderful diversity of appendages. I showed you some hammering shrimp, some spearing shrimp, they're hatcheting shrimp, there are no nothing shrimp, they just sort of have a, like a stabbing device. And it's allowed us to look at the evolutionary history and diversification of these systems. This is a phylogeny of mantis shrimp that's wildly pruned, so there are over 400 species of mantis shrimp. But at the base of that arrow is where we see the evolutionary origin of smashing about 50 million years ago. Smashers evolved from spearers. So smashers are modified spearing mantis shrimp. And one kind of neat thing on that is that teeny tiny larval baby mantis, smashing mantis shrimp are spearers. And then they turn into smashers. So it's a nice ontogeny that capitulates biologically as well as it often does. With the origin of smashing, you now know, came extreme acceleration, a more potent spring, force modified muscle, and smaller maximum body size. You know, I spent the last week playing with this talk to, to give to you guys today, and I really actually just want to give a whole talk about this last point I'm going to talk about today, which is why did manta shrimp essentially collapse their size range when they moved to smashing? And those of you who know your history of body mechanics, so the people that have been asking this question for ages, Borelli, Huxley, Vogel, have been asking why the best acceleration performance only happens in tiny animals. And here in Manchester, we see a drastic compression of maximum body size with the transition smash. I have an idea about this. Let's talk to you about that. Um, anyway, so this is what this approach lets us do. There also, there's also a fossil record, which is fine. So let me show you two quick things about how we look at the dynamics of these systems, and then I'll talk about what happens when you go impulsive, why it's not all great. Familiar terms probably for many of you, which is the connection between kinematic transmission, which is the output rotation divided by the rotation for, for, a, for a linkage, relative to mechanical advantage, which we define as percent input force transfer to the output. So what I've done is mapped these two mechanical characteristics onto this graph, and then overlaid the evolutionary tree onto these points. And what we see is a consistent and persistent and significant, statistically significant move towards a different mechanical space between smashers and spears. Spears are all about displacement amplification. Smashers are all about force amplification. So that's a kind of a simple example of how to incorporate a phylogeny into a mechanical analysis, showing um, a deeply embedded trend in the group. But what I want to do is talk about two other slightly more challenging topics. Um, and I, I have a mission with, with expressing this to all of you because I think this is a place where we can really, as a field of biomechanics, really do some neat stuff with this. So there's a, there's a um, uh, sort of a buzzword, at least on the organismal side of biomechanics, not human, but I'm interested to know if human folks um, have heard about this, which is this notion of many-to-one mapping, or mechanical equivalence. And the idea is you can have a mechanical system, and you can have an output, and you can solve that output in many different ways. And over evolutionary time, you can actually generate a whole space of mechanical combinations that gives you the same mechanical output. So it's called many-to-one mapping. The graph that I put up here is showing KT, kinematic transmission in mantis shrimp, which is uh, the output from the forward linkage system. And you can see blue and green colors spread all over that graph. And what that means is that they can use any kind of combination to get the same output. Many to one mapping, mechanical equivalence. This, is, this has been thought of as a great source of diversity in biology, is the ability to do multiple configurations to get one output over evolutionary time. So we decided to look at this more closely. We are curious whether this persisted at the link lengths in the system. And what we find in the orange link, you can see there are lots of different link lengths that give you different KTs. On the blue, on the far side, there are lots of different link lengths that give you different KTs. But the red bar is tightly correlated, tightly, tightly, tightly correlated. And what we find is that the whole system is wildly sensitive to one little mechanical component. And that raises the question, what should happen here? If you have a mechanical system that's very, very sensitive to one component, 
Should this be associated with a decrease in evolutionary rate of training, change, or an increase? And to our surprise, there's an increase in rate of evolutionary change with mechanical sensitivity. And that means that if you have a very mechanically sensitive component in your system, that teeny tiny tweaks actually have huge effects on the overall output of the system, and that actually enhances evolutionary rates of change. I think this is super relevant for placing our work in this world of biomechanics into the biology that we study and start to address, well, what does evolution play with? And in this case, tremendous sensitivity is good, actually. But it's not all good. So taking a completely different approach, again, I can give an entire lecture on this, but I'm just going to give you a quick, brief overview. We decided to ask, well, if we have an engine, an amplifier, and a tool, if we tweak one, does everything have to change with it over evolutionary time and also during development? We looked at this in many different papers, many different dimensions. And simply put, in smashers, if you're going to play a little bit with the muscle or a little bit with the spring or a little bit with the tool, everything else changes with it. In spears, you can play a little bit with the spring, play a little bit with the tool, and you don't have to change everything else. So that means that smashers are extremely tightly integrated, not just from a mechanical point of view, but from an evolutionary point of view. And with that extreme integration came a drastic decrease in the rate of evolutionary change of the whole system. Smashers evolved two to 10 times more, slow, more slowly than spears. So when we think about these extraordinary mechanical feats of these impulsive systems, they require mechanical integration enhanced mechanical integration, which we can actually see over evolutionary time as a constraint, as a limiter in these systems. And you know, I've been working with engineers a lot on one of my grants, and one of the things that they often complain about with developing extremely lightweight, robust, you know, high-performance, teeny tiny systems is the ability to have these incredibly tightly integrated structures that are inherent to biology. And here we see that even when it's inherent to biology, so, extreme impulsive performance slows down evolutionary change. All right. Now for some fun stuff. I know that was a lot of work. I hope you all had your coffee before coming here. Losing control demands alternative behaviors. Okay. So first I'm going to tell you a quick story about what all else mantis shrimp do. So I've been talking all about like smashing mantis shrimp, breaking open snail shells, so on and so forth, about the acceleration of a bullet. Well, it turns out they really do have a problem related to accelerating at the um, acceleration of a bullet, and that is they have lethal weapons. And if you're familiar with the world of animal behavior theory, if an animal has lethal weapons, they have to come up with a way to use them non-lethally to settle disputes. There is a lot to learn there, in my opinion, about humans today. Um, and so you can talk to me about some of this work I've been doing in Washington, D.C. on this topic. Um, and the, yeah, anyway, we'll go to the ranch with that. Um, anyway, so what we've been looking at is how these managers with lethal weaponry solve their problems. And again, this is a whole talk in and of itself. But essentially, theory predicts that they ought to be doing some kind of ritualized um, signaling that's non-lethal to resolve it. And what we found is that in size match mantis shrimp, they spar. And spar in the absolute, like, athletic sense of the term. They do not, uh, they, they do not win by having the greatest force. They win by having the greatest number of strikes. And what they do is they hit back and forth between their hammer and a specialized piece of armor. So this picture on the bottom is of an animal coming in with its hammers ready to fire, or actually firing, and moving towards the specialized armor, the telson in the mantra. And they hit back and forth until they solve it. And they do it with the number of strikes, not using their maximum capabilities. They will eventually move to a deadly stab, but very, very rarely. So they prefer to spar. How about that? Here's a crazy thing. Maybe this occurred to all of you. So these mantis shrimp, yes, they're sparring, meaning that they're looking at, um, they're producing a lot of strikes, but they're still generating some serious acceleration. We've been looking at energy flow in the system, and it's still insanely amazing. And it does not break the talcid. So the armor itself has something to teach us 
And we did a number, we did a research, uh, did some research on the coefficient of restitution. Those of you who are interested in sports stuff know that this is just a uh, metric for energy exchange between two impacting structures. And it perfectly matches the interaction between the baseball bat, an ash baseball bat, and a baseball. So that, that impact between the hammer and, um, and that piece of armor is just like that. And it works actually a lot like a, um, a punching bag as opposed to a trampoline. So there's a lot of energy absorption in that. But here's a crazy thing. We ran these tests across the whole animal, not just the telson, but all of the parts. And the impact mechanics, the energy exchange, scales with body size, but only in the armor. So it is within the realm of possibility that they're actually learning about each other's size from the impact mechanics themselves. So here's a problem. And again, we know this intuitively, but somehow it's very intriguing to find it in animals as well and how they navigate it. When movements happen too quickly for real-time neural control, that's all impulsive motion for the most part, other than jumping, which is a little bit. Variation in kinematics was happening for movement. So Manta Shrimp Strike was such a short duration, they cannot control any of it once it's fired. We know this from shooting arrows, bullets, whatever. Once that thing is gone, it's gone. It's going to be what it's going to do. So it's all about setting it up. Here, of course, they're not getting rid of the Manta Shrimp, are not getting rid of the hammer. But they have to set it up ahead of time. So we asked, can they actually um, control the output? And what we found is that smashers do vary velocity through muscle activity strikes. So we can see a different degree of muscle contraction translating into a different amount of spring loading. And then that, that varies the output velocity. But if you think about this, what the, how in the world are they going to learn what they're doing? And how do they even know ahead of time how to modify a strike? And actually, for that matter, how in the world do they break open style shells to begin with? We don't really understand. Do they have a strategy? So this turns out to be, so this turned out to be, this project, the, the electrophysiology project, was hard but straightforward. What's been really hard is asking Mantis Shrimp, what do they know about the mechanics of the snail shell? Does cavitation actually help break over the snail shell? What do high peak impact forces do? I tell you, engineers do not know the answer to this question, and I, I mean, I'm willing to go anywhere to figure this one out. So we've been doing some fun stuff. So I'm going to end with three like fun slides, and hopefully it'll inspire some of you. And come and show, tell me, come see your crazy projects and your labs at, at the conference on the The first one again referring to Suzanne Cox. Suzanne, wait, this is such a cool project. Um, she built Ninjabot. Ninjabot is a model mantis shrimp because mantis shrimp are a pain sometimes. Animals, of course, are always a pain. They don't always do exactly what you tell them to do. So we thought, let's do a controlled board. So Suzanne and I are dreamers. Um, Suzanne, on the other hand, is not just a dreamer, but she actually is one of the best machinists I've ever met. She built NinjaBot, and NinjaBot is essentially a control bullet. And when we started this, engineers told us it wasn't possible. It actually literally wasn't possible to do what Mantis Shrimp do, um, because there wasn't the, the knowledge of spring dynamics in engineering. Um, and so she figured out how to do it. But notice that NinjaBot is 9 kilograms of steel compared to 8.4 grams. So we're still working on materials. But essentially what NinjaBot allows us to do is to put, you know, put um, shells in front of it. We can swap out. That's showing NinjaBot with a piece of metal cylinder. We can actually put real appendages on NinjaBot on it. And ask, um, what does it take to actually break open a style shell? So we're in the middle of analyzing these data. Hopefully this data will come out in the next year. But in the, along the way, I just wanted to mention, so the vagaries of curiosity-based research, and this obviously has a lot of practical implications as well for right on the engineering side. What um, Suzanne actually discovered is that mantis shrimp appendages do not cavitate during forward rotation, but everything else does. And when we put mantis shrimp appendages on NinjaBot, they cavitate during forward rotation, which has now set us off in this fluid dynamics realm of a dynamic interaction between the shape and the path through the water that reduces cavitation inception, uh, which actually might help with the design of growth propellers. So sort of a random thing that we're trying to solve a shell smashing problem and ended up in a pretty cool area of fluid dynamics. Actually, a pretty freaking hard area of fluid dynamics. Okay, so we have NinjaBot to help us ask questions, but we also have the animals. So let me show you an animal working with a sail. So there it is. It's setting it up. 
moving it around, feeling it, placing it, touching it. This is a very um, high spired snail that pointy area is called the apex. Oh, decided to clean its uh, eyebrow. Middle there, um, feeling it. Oh, didn't like the position. Touching it again. Hits the snail. Hits the snail again. No luck, still broken. The apex is in piece. Um, a lot of setup, right? And there, just broke off the top. And that right there is a happy vantage room. I don't know if you can see its whole body relax. It starts to chew on a nice snail, a piece of snail. What we've discovered is that they do have an algorithm. And Smashers hit snails. This shape of snail, starting with, um, with sequential systematic behavior, starting with the aperture and then the spire. Aperture is that open area, spire is the tip. And it differs depending on the snail shell, the, the shape of the snail shell. So they seem to know something. They have to plan this out ahead. As you can see, they're doing a lot of planning and setting up these strengths ahead of time. But that leaves us with one more kind of funky thing, which is, again, what does the mantis shrimp sense? What is it queuing in on with these snail shapes? And um, this led to, I think, one of my most fun favorite projects, which is we give them shapes. So this is a little cylinder. They're happy that these animals are very amenable to this. You can see a little hole inside the cylinder there that has food in it. The animal can taste that food there. It knows exactly where the food is. But it does not hit on the hole where the food is. It's finding a different mechanical place to strike. And um, it will very systematically work on the edges of the cylinder, knowing full well that the food is somewhere else. So what we're learning is that smashes hit edges rather than the hole containing food. And this is, a, this is like, a 25-year project on our 3D printer, right? Because, I mean, you can imagine the number of different spaces and configurations to ask this. So essentially, while the engineers and physicists are trying to figure out how, how super high peak impact breaks mollusks, we're asking the animals to tell us um, what they know and see if we can bring the two together. Okay. So the impulsive realm. I'd love to have discussions uh, throughout the next couple of days. Is it also the right word? Or do we go back to ultra fast? Because what is fast? Fast is obviously something that we're seeing very differently now in this field, especially with increased um, imaging capabilities where we can really capture the bullet like accelerations and millimeters. It's not easy to be powerful, it takes a long time, huge impacts for ecology. But these animals get access to a very different ecology. So small animals get uh, big animal performance. But all impulsive animals are small. Why? Extreme impulsive performance slows down evolutionary change. Super tight mechanical integration does come with costs over evolutionary timescales. And losing control demands alternative behaviors. So if you're going to have a lethal weapon, you've got to come up with some alternatives to settlement disputes. And it poses some serious challenges for planning ahead and learning from behavior. So what I hope I've done is, yes, been a little bit of a maverick in the context of very humans-oriented conference, but also I hope what you've seen is a lot of the same methods, same thinking, same problems that we see in the vertebrate realm with the classic um, trio of issues with energy dissipation, energy efficiency, power amplification, and even that ever-present force velocity trade-off that's so fascinating in muscle. So I thank you so much for your attention today, and I want to acknowledge so many people. You saw many of the faces of the students at postdocs on the slides as I went. Um, these are some of the funding agencies I'm very, very grateful for, um, having dealt with DC a lot this year. Believe me, anybody has funding from federal government right now, I'm very grateful. Um, and these are just a few of the folks who have been involved in this research, just an amazing team. Everything that I talked about today is because of the team that I had in my lab over the past uh, so thank you for your attention. I'm happy to take some, some uh, questions from you. I think we have three to five minutes for questions. What we're going to do is if people could queue up behind the microphones, if you have a question. Um, I'll start it off. So how transferable are these ideas to human scale devices? Like, like in my lab, do you think I can take ideas from that to shrimp and, and build a device that could let someone slam dunk or is my height? Yeah, so um, Greg asked, how transferable are these ideas to human devices? 
devices. And actually, I will have a five-year grant to ask, answer that exact question. So we have a team of mathematician engineers and biologists working intensively together, actually in the context of um, an Army Research Office URI uh, grant that we And we're, we're asking that question, and, and I actually, you know, the process of, of kind of combining what we all know from these different fields. I think there is one thing that really stands, to, that's really good news for moving these um, small impulsive critter knowledge to a broader framework. And that relates to why all impulsive animals, all impulsive organisms are small. So I think, and this is inspired by Steve Ogle, that it relates to materials and material movements in biology. Essentially, materials are great in biology, but not that great. And at some point, it just simply cannot withstand any more um, elastic strain, and they, they fail. But engineered polymers are actually really fantastic. They work really well. So I'm actually hopeful that once we start to understand how to integrate these components, track energy flow, which is very difficult, all of you know that, um, that we can start putting new materials into this that are better than what biology has to offer. So I, I think materials are a really intriguing direction to go, and I'm working pretty hard on that, especially related to the, um, the real-time dynamics of materials which we don't understand very well at these extremely short time scales. Okay, yeah. if you could tell us who you are and what institution you're from, that would be great. Okay. Uh, great talk, Yang Chang, uh, Georgia Tech. Um, you know, many years ago, uh, Ted Goslow did some really nice work uh, showing that muscle fatigue and pigeon flight muscle um, can, can influence how they sort of run away from prey. You, know, you only get a few shots and then they, they take off for good. Um, and I'm wondering if, uh, if something like muscle fatigue plays a role in this algorithm that you talked about, the strategy for opening shells. Does it, do they have a certain um, number of strikes that they can get before they have to stop? Absolutely. I mean, these, they get tired. And one convenient thing about mantis shrimp is that their gills are under their tail. I probably should have put that out when I showed you those videos. So you can actually see them panting more and more and more the more they're striking. And eventually, they just have to stop. And some of these snails, like, you know, some snails, they'll, they'll nail them the first time, like one of those early videos I showed. But if they're working on a large snail, I mean, I actually saw a mantis shrimp about the size of a cigar working on a snail, like the size of a large, larger than a golf ball. And it worked on it for like two weeks. So they do, they'll come back to it over and over again. Um, but fatigue is a big part of it. And actually the, the more detailed uh, muscle physiology of these systems I think is going to be very interesting. Something you just haven't looked beyond um, just straight up start in your life. And so I think that there's going to be interesting stuff related to fatigue in these systems. It's huge. As you know, you know force modified muscles um, are, are going to be very limited. Thanks. Mike over there. Hi. Uh, hey. Great talk, Alvin Chen, Ohio State. Uh, your work on management reminded me of a YouTube channel called Smarter Every Day. Um, and you mentioned that you've done some advocacy work in continuing basic science education in the classroom. How important it is, is it to not only continue that, but also try to bring this sort of research, this sort of knowledge, onto more accessible forms, such as like YouTube? Yeah, so um, smarter every day. I'll tell you a story about that later. <laughs> That's actually really funny. Um, so yeah, I have been working with the press intensively for 20 years. I get requests almost every day of the week, and it's actually, you know, sometimes it's annoying. Um, but I, I view it when I when I get over some of the frustration with that. Actually, there's some interesting things that have happened over there. Um, but what I see it as an opportunity to. Um, so get people inspired about organisms, but everything we do is about physics and evolution. And it is amazing how willing the general public is to learn about well, what is peak force, what is the area under the curve, um, what is cavitation. I mean, I've had little kids and adults like going on and on about cavitation many, many times. So um, it's, I think it's a, a, a huge opportunity because these animals are dynamic. And we're working on very hard physics problems with them. Um, to use that to educate the public. You know, one of the things that, that came up this, this year um, was 
when you put yourself out on the line as a scientist um, and popularize your research, which I'm willing to do to some extent because we're federally funded and I feel that it's my civic obligation to, given that I work on these types of systems, to make it accessible to the public, um, is that it also leaves you open for criticism by our elected officials. And so I was targeted very heavily this year um, by a senator um, that, that the research is a waste of money. And um, you can see I did a PBS News Hour um, uh, commentary about it. And um, you know, one of the things that came from that is actually ended up being very positive. I met with him um, in a very public setting. And I explained this stuff to him, and he actually liked it. And, I, and he, for all intents and purposes, the senator apologized for, um, for targeting our work. And I think the problem was that he and his staff, it's mostly his staff, were seeing this sort of like cute, quirky stories about fighting manta shrimp, um, and really not able to or not having the knowledge base to realize how all of this connects into everything from like the value of basic knowledge to things, you know, literally re relevant to, um, to, to our, the security, national security of the country. And so, you know, one of the things that I think is so important as we work to popularize our research is to really express what basic knowledge is. It's not, I mean, what we do, what I just talked to you today, is for a group of scientists and engineers who understand the value of basic research. But a lot of people don't understand what a discovery is, the fact that it has unanticipated outcomes, and that those outcomes can be really incredible. And frankly, everything started with unanticipated outcomes in science, since I'm doing it. So I think that, that it's become more of a broader issue. So, yeah, thank you. Okay, I think we're running a little bit over time. I want to make sure we keep on schedule. Let's uh, thank Dr. Patek one more time.